everyone and welcome to our virtual planetarium experience with astronomy in action. Uh, my name is Emma Barker and I am the manager of public services at the Blue Mountains Public Library and today I am so excited to introduce you to an astronomer Julia from Astronomy in Action who makes space for everyone and she is going to guide us through a virtual planetarium experience and take your questions and I'm just really looking forward to going to space with you guys. So with that being said, Julia, welcome to the Blue Mountains Public Library. Thank you very much. So I'm going to spotlight myself for everybody. So hopefully you can all see my screen. I invite you all to turn on your cameras if you'd like, um, but I understand um, you don't have to, uh, but I promise I am somebody behind the screen here. Hello, everybody. Thank you all for having me today. I am so excited to be here to talk to you all about astronomy, about space, and take us on a little adventure into space today as well. So I'm sure many of you likely have questions and questions will come up throughout the presentation. And there's a couple ways that you can ask questions. The first is in your reaction section at the bottom bar of the, the Zoom a meeting, you can actually raise your hand like I'm doing right now. And I can see the participants list and I will see who has their hand up. So you feel free to raise your hand if questions come up and I'm happy to answer them. And I'm gonna lower my hand before I forget. And the other way that you can ask a question in case uh, you don't wanna forget is you can actually type it uh, right here in the chat. So you can type it in the chat and I can take a look and answer those questions as we move through. And you'll see that we'll start off the, um, the program kind of here on Earth and look up into space. Um, but as the program moves through, it will be guided by the questions that you ask um, and we'll look at some of uh, the things that you are interested in as well. So is everybody okay with how to ask questions? You can put a thumbs up in the reactions if you'd like. Perfect, yes, where you will be flying into space, okay? So I am so excited to be here. We'll get started right away um, by looking at space from Earth. And that's the study of astronomy. Astronomy is looking up with your eyes, which are the best tools that you have to study space and study everything around you, okay? And so we're gonna start doing that by looking up at the daytime uh, what it looks like right now. Now I've put the location here to Collingwood. I know you aren't in Collingwood, you're in the Blue Mountains, um, but it's the closest I could get on this program. Um, so this is kind of what the daytime sky might look like right now. Is it sunny out for everybody? Yeah, a little bit? Okay. Um, so to study space, we need a little bit of um, we need to look at the nighttime sky. And so I am going to change the time here. The fun part of this is I can change it very easily. And so we're gonna go to about 8 p or 9 p.m. today, okay? And this is what the nighttime sky is going to look like within your area. Now, in the night sky, there's many different stars that actually create patterns. And a long, long time ago, there were people that lived on Earth that looked up at the night sky and saw those patterns and created stories around those patterns. And those are what we call constellations. And so there are many different constellations. If I zoom out here, these are the ones that will be in the night sky tonight that you can observe. And there's some really interesting ones that actually tell some fun stories, but it can also help us navigate on land. And so the first one that we're gonna look at is, I'm gonna turn off those lines here, is the one that starts with this star. And there's seven stars that are part of this constellation. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And they form kind of this big spoon in the sky. And that's what we call the Big Dipper. And the Big Dipper, as you probably saw with the lines here, 
um, but I'll show it again, is that it looks, um, it is part of this larger constellation called Ursa Major, which is actually a bear in the night sky, um, which is kind of fun. But the smaller part of the constellation, this spoon shape here, is the Big Dipper. Now the Big Dipper is really useful in helping us find a very important star that helps us navigate. And the way that we do that is we find the end of the Big Dipper here, and it points directly to this star called Polaris. And its name is Polaris, but it also has another name. Does anyone know what that other name might be? And if you have your camera on, you can raise your hand. Does anyone know what the other name for that star might be? Oh, I see. There's a yes in the. Anyone know? Anyone want to take a guess? And you can look at the coordinate point, it gives you a hint. Polar star, very close. Look at where it's pointing, everyone. Does anyone want to take a guess? You can unmute yourself. If, oh, I see the answer in the chat. Oh, Elliot, do you want to answer? The North Star. The North Star, you're absolutely correct. And I see that Sarah put that in the chat as well. It is the North Star. And so the reason it's called the North Star is because that star from Earth always looks like it's pointing north. And if I zoom out here, we can look at the night sky. And if I speed up time here a little bit, it will look like all the other stars are moving around uh, the North Star. And they're not actually moving around that star. The Earth is rotating, which is causing it to look like they're moving. We're the ones actually moving. But because of where Polaris is located, it will always be pointing north. And so we can use that to help us navigate when we're on land. And there's many different ways to remember those coordinate points. So we have north, east, south, and west. The ones that I love, so there's a, one that most people know, which is never eat shredded wheat. The other one that I think is funny and makes me laugh every time is naughty elephant squirt water. But I'd also love to hear what everyone else, what's the trick that you use to remember your coordinate points? Does anyone have a fun one? I'll share a really funny one in a minute. Okay, the funny one that a lot of people love is, um, and it's a good life lesson too, but never enter smelly washrooms, which is a very funny one to try and remember those coordinate points. But if you ever go out camping, you can find that North Star. Now I'm gonna go back in time here a little bit, just so we have the Big Dipper in view a little bit better. And what you're going to do is when you're out camping and you wanna find that North Star, the first thing you're going to do is actually find the Big Dipper because you can see here that the Big Dipper, the stars are much brighter, right? They're much easier to see um, out in space. And so you're going to find these seven stars and reach the seventh one here. And once you find that seven star, there's one thing you're going to do, and I'm gonna come back to everybody now. What you're going to do is give me a thumbs up, okay? For those of you in the camera, you can give me a thumbs up. And then you're gonna stick out your pinky finger. And believe it or not, this is what phones used to look like when I was your age, <laughs> for some of you. Uh, but, so remember the old school telephone and what you're going to do is you're gonna stick it up to the night sky. And your pinky finger will touch the seventh star of the Big Dipper and your thumb will touch the North Star, okay? And so that is how you can find it. Remember the old school telephone. And it doesn't matter how tall or small you are, this trick works for everybody, okay? Sounds good? We know how to find our North Star? Okay. So let's look back up into space and at our stars. So we've looked at the Big Dipper. We looked at our North Star. And our North Star is part of another constellation called the Little Dipper which is the smaller spoon in our night sky. 
Okay. And this uh, little dipper is also called Ursa Minor, which is the smaller bear up in the sky. Okay. And so those are two constellations that you can look for. And they're actually present all year round. So you can see them any time of year, no matter, uh, well, not no matter where you are, because it'll depend on how much light pollution you have. So if you live in a big city, it will be a little bit harder to see. Um, but if you're in the countryside and there's not a lot of lights on at night within your city, you can actually see these quite well. Now, do we have any questions so far? Don't see any hands up. No? Okay. I'll keep going. We're going to look at another constellation that I really love. And he's, it's a really cool one to look up at our night sky. And he's typically located right here. And this one, we can see here, it kind of looks like a person. So his shoulders are represented by these two stars here. His head is here. And then these are his legs. And this is actually the constellation of Orion the Hunter. And so there you can see the artwork of Orion. Uh, and Orion is a really cool constellation. The way that you can find him is through the three stars that are really close together in the middle here that make up his belt, okay? And so they make up his belt. You can find that pretty easily. Um, and it's only actually visible in the winter time. So uh, close, leading up to the summer, we won't actually be able to see Orion anymore until the following winter. So this is the time to go find Orion in the night sky. Now, Orion, you can find him from those three stars that are close together. And just below that make up part of his sword, if we zoom in here, is this very cool um, part of our night sky and an uh, astronomy um, phenomenon uh, is the Orion Nebula. And so this is the Orion Nebula up in our night sky. Now we can't actually see the Orion Nebula without a telescope or binoculars. So if you have any of those at home, you can look for the nebula. Um, and a nebula is where new stars are going to form. And so let's take a trip to Orion's Nebula and look a little bit at what it looks like up close. So here we go. So hold on to your seats as we speed up through space. Here we go. And we're gonna get up very close to Orion's Nebula. And here we are. So this is Orion's Nebula. It's amazing to see it in 3D because in the other image, it was more of a 2D image. So it kind of looked flat but it's actually this big 3D object in space. And this is where new stars are going to form, like the star that's in our solar system, which is the sun. And so new stars will form out of the gas and the dust that's found within this nebula. And there's a lot of energy that goes into making stars. And so there's these beautiful nebulas. They can look similar, a little bit different depending, um, but they'll have different colors that come out from them uh, because of what's found within those nebulas. And so this is Orion's Nebula. And you can actually find this one if you have a telescope or binoculars at home. You can look for it in that nighttime sky, okay? Any questions so far on our nebulas? on Orion's Nebula or any of the constellations. Oh, I see uh, Janet, might be your mom's name. <laughs> yeah. Um, my name's Emily and um, the, beside the um, constellation that we're looking at, mm -hmm. is it Ryan's? Yeah, Orion. Oh, yeah. Ryan. Um, is there the horse constellation? So there is a horse constellation. So I'm going to zoom out here and come back. Um, so the horse, so are you talking about this one right here? Um, because no, I can tell. So this one is actually of the dog. So this yeah. is 
Canis Major, but there is a horse one and there's the unicorn yeah. right next to him. Is that the one you were thinking of? Yeah. Yeah. So that is um, the, the constellation of Monoceros. Uh, I don't have too much information on him, um, but it's a really beautiful one. And you can actually, if you see Orion, you can try and find that constellation because it is right next to it. Okay. Um, but I don't have too much information on Monoceros, but it is quite a beautiful one to see in the night sky, right? Um, yeah. But did you have a specific question about it or wanting to know maybe the story behind it? Um, why, how do they name, um, the constellations after, like, um, an animal or a person, that is a great question. And I love that question. So the names, so the names that you're seeing for all of these constellations comes from primarily Greek and Roman mythology. So it was people who, um, who were looking up at the night sky and were making these stories and describing these shapes based off of their experience. And so they, these are primarily Greek, um, Greek names um, and Greek origin. And, but depending on where you're from and depending on maybe the culture that you came from, there's actually different stories. So in Canada, a lot of um, the indigenous communities actually have maybe similar constellations, but they represent different things. So the constellation of Ursa Major, so the bear, if I go back to our bear, pardon me for the quick movement, um, of Ursa Major here, in, I believe it's Cree or Mohawk, it's actually representative of a caribou. So it's not a bear, for them it's a caribou. So depending on where you're from, these constellations can represent different animals which is amazing. And they have different stories based off of them. But the ones I'm showing you come from the Greek mythology um, and more of um, the Western perspective of constellations, okay? And so one thing with Ursa Major, so Ursa means bear. So that's kind of where those names come from and Major just means bigger. So this is the bigger bear and this is the little bear. Does that answer your question, Emily? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Well done. I love that question. Do we have any other questions before we keep going? No? Okay. Now, I'm going to ask you all a question. I want to know, does anyone know what this, and I gave this away a little bit earlier, but does anyone know what the star, the one star in our solar system is? And it comes up every day. You see it? Is it a sun? It is the sun. Well done. It is the sun. So the sun is the only star in our solar system. Um, and it's what all of our planets orbit around. And so um, I will show you. Here we go. So our sun... We have all our planets here, which we will look at in a moment, but we're going to add the sun and look at the size of our sun compared to all of the planets. Okay. And get ready here because it's a lot bigger. Here we go. And there is our sun compared to all of our planets. And we're right in there, one of those little planets there. Um, but our sun is what produces heat and produces light. And that's what keeps us warm on earth, right? And it's what gives the temperatures for different planets. Um, and it's what all of our planets orbit around is our sun, okay? And so the sun is the only star in our solar system, but there are thousands of stars within our galaxy, which is the Milky Way, and within the universe in general. So my next question for all of you though, do we think our sun is a big star or a small star? You can put your answer in the chat if you'd like. Can I just you... answer from here? Yes, go for it. Um, I think it's one of the biggest stars. 
Okay, one of the biggest stars. Does anyone else want to take a guess? You can unmute yourself if you'd like. Or you can put it in the chat, whichever one you'd prefer. Big star or small star? Small? Okay. So we have one guess for big, one guess for small. Well, let's take a look at our at stars in general. So, oh, another one, small. Okay. So actually, I look, think small too. You okay. think small too? Changing yeah. your answer? That's fair. That's fair. So everyone who said small, you're actually correct. It's kind of a smaller star. And there's some very, very large ones. Now, one thing to note before we look at some more stars is that stars are what produce heat and light, as I mentioned, and planets, so in our solar system, there's eight, they orbit around the, a star and they reflect light, okay? They reflect the light, they don't produce their own light. So we need stars to be able to stay warm and to see things and produce light, okay? And so let's look at some of these stars. We have our sun there, keeping our solar, that's at the center of our solar system and keeps us warm here on earth. And now we're gonna move out, okay? And so this is another star that's a little bit larger than our sun. And this is a blue star, okay? Now, looking at these two stars, which one do we think is warmer or hotter, a blue star or a red and yellow star? I can see people thinking. You can unmute yourselves. Red. Yellow. Yellow, yellow or red, I love that. Thank you, okay. So most, a couple of people said that the red and yellow stars are hotter. Well, that might have been a trick question on my part because it's actually the blue ones. I see Emily that said it. Yeah, so it's the blue ones that are hotter. And I know it's shocking. The way to think about it though, is to think about a campfire or if you light a candle at home. What color is the bottom of the flame when you light a campfire or a candle? Blue or like purple? Like blue and yeah, purple. blue and purple. Exactly. So it's that blue color. And that's actually the hottest part of a campfire is the blue part underneath. Okay. And so when you see a blue star, it is those that those stars that are actually much hotter than those red and yellow stars. So we're going to keep looking at some of these stars. We're going to look a little bit more. And this star is almost even white. And that's even hotter than those blue stars. Okay but it gets a little bit bigger than that in star in the size of these stars. So here's another star that's massive compared to our sun. It's quite big, but it's still not the biggest star that we've ever discovered. They get a little bit bigger and they get even bigger than that. There are some big stars out there. And remember that blue one is hotter than that red or yellow one. And here's another huge star that's in our universe. What is okay. the big star in the universe? I'll answer that once we get to the end of this video. Good question, Emily. We'll get to that very shortly. This star's name is Rigel. And Rigel, you can actually see in the Orion constellation, okay? It's one of the brightest stars in the Orion constellation. And you can actually see that um, at this time of year. So that's Rigel. And he's, I believe, a blue giant. But there's a larger one than Rigel. They get even bigger. I know, right? It's shocking. But it's still not the largest star. They get even bigger than that. And this is the star called Betelgeuse. And Betelgeuse is part of the Orion constellation. Now, for everybody, I will not say his, the name a third time. But this star you can see in our night sky, um, and it's a red supergiant, okay? Because he's huge. And remember, our sun is all the way at the end of the line of those stars, okay? So it's much smaller than some of these. But it gets even bigger than that. 
and even a little bit bigger. And we still haven't reached the end. There's even larger stars. And this is the largest one. This last star here, his name is Stevenson 218. And I'll put the name in the chat if you'd like to look it up a little later. So this is Stevenson 218. It's the largest star that we've discovered, okay? It is a huge star, but because it's so big, it's not gonna have a very long life, okay? Because it's so big, it can't contain all the energy that it produces. And so it'll have a shorter life than our sun. Okay, our sun can contain some of that, that energy and control that a little bit more than some of the larger stars. And so we're, what we're going to do now is travel back to our sun and look at our sun in comparison to all of these stars. Okay, so that's the largest one. And here we go. And our sun is gonna look very, very small compared to some of these stars. Here we go. And there's our sun. So just to show you a little bit more in comparison, our sun next to some of these massive stars. Yes, so our sun is on the scale of stars, it's a little bit of a smaller star, um, but it's what keeps us alive every day and uh, helps us live our lives and be here and talk about space because our sun is keeping our planet warm, okay? And so those are some of the larger stars in our, in, um, our galaxy and in the universe. Questions on stars so far? Um, why do like three stars or like three or four stars look like the same almost? Like they're both all yellow and like light and dark in places? Yeah, so the reason that we have those different colors is because of the reactions that are taking place on the surface of those stars. And so they kind of look maybe of a similar size, but they're all a little bit different in size. Uh, and as we move along the line there towards the end, they're even bigger than the other ones. And it's just because of the perspective on how we're looking at the stars right now that they kind of look similar. But those colors come from what is happening within this inside of that star. And so it's producing all of these reactions and chemical reactions that make these beautiful colors, okay? And so um, the biggest star is the Stevenson 218, as Elliot put in the chat, absolutely. Um, and Stevenson 218 is a red supergiant. And so it's a little bit cooler of a star, but it's massive. And so the colors come from um, how they're reacting and the light that they're emitting. So we see them as red and yellow, um, but they, so they produce those colors. I hope that answers your question a little bit, Emily. Yeah? Okay. So do we have any other questions before we keep going? And if you'd like, you can put them in the chat, okay? So we've looked at stars. We can see all of these different stars here, but we actually haven't looked at our planets yet. So question for everybody here before I show this video, name some planets in the chat that you know of. What are some planets that you know in our solar system? Earth, yes, absolutely. And there's Earth right there, which is where we live. Mars, well done. Earth, Mars, and Jupiter, absolutely. Venus, well done. Venus, well, yes, absolutely. I see Emma's typing away Saturn. Give it another minute. Mercury, well done. Okay. 
so you've named a bunch of the planets. We have Mars again, absolutely. So the planet that we live on, Pluto, not anymore. I love that. And we'll actually talk a little bit about Pluto afterwards. So we live on Earth, which is the third planet in our solar system. And so we're going to start looking at some of these planets. And you'll see in a moment, the mouse is just going to go over a little area here. And that's where we live. So you can wave to yourself from space, OK, as we're in space right now. Jupiter, thank you, Elliot. Absolutely. And so now we're going to start adding our planets. And the closest planet to our sun is actually the planet of Mercury, which I believe someone mentioned before. So Mercury is the closest planet to our sun. And it's the smallest planet in our solar system. Now, the next one that we're adding here is Venus. And Venus is a very interesting planet because it has a thick atmosphere. So it has a very thick layer of gas around Venus that keeps it very warm. Now, my question for you, for everybody here, do we think Mercury is hotter or Venus is hotter? Which planet do we think is a hotter planet? Elliot, go for it. Um, I think Mercury is hotter because it's closer to the sun. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. So if Mercury is closer to the sun. I see a guess for Venus. Well, the one that's actually hotter is actually Venus. Because Venus, because of the thick layer of gas that's around Venus, it traps all of the heat that it gains from the sun. And because of that, on an average day on the planet Venus, it's about 460 degrees Celsius, which is very, very hot. It's even hotter than your oven when you go and make dinner or cook anything. So it's extremely hot on the surface of Venus. And we'll look at the surface a little bit later. But Mercury, Elliot, you're absolutely right. It is hot during the daytime on Mercury. It's about 400 degrees on the surface of Mercury, but at night on Mercury, it's about minus 150 degrees Celsius. So there's this huge range in temperature when you live, if you ever lived on Mercury. But let's keep going. So we have Mercury, Venus, and then Earth. Oh, Elliot, do you have a question? Well, um, there is two planets that everyone forgot. Oh, they, which are ones? they are Uranus and Neptune. Well done. Uranus and Neptune. Absolutely. And, and the, yeah, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Re Uranus is an yeah. ice giant, so is Neptune, but Neptune has one of the strongest winds and thunderstorms. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that, Elliot. Absolutely. And we'll look at those very shortly, okay? So we have Mercury, Venus, Earth, and then the next one, which a few people mentioned here, which is Mars. And Mars is our red planet. It's right after Earth. It's a beautiful planet. It's a little bit smaller than Earth, okay? And it's actually quite a cold planet. It's about minus 60 degrees Celsius on the surface of Venus, um, the surface of Mars, part of me. And so we wouldn't really want to live there right now. It'd be even colder than it is in the winter time. Elliot, do you have a question? I think Mars is kind of as cold as um, Antarctica because Antarctica is minus 60 and Mars is minus 60. Exactly. So we need those big winter coats and a lot of winter gear to live on Mars, right? Um, and so Mars is quite cold of a planet. And to get to Mars would take us about eight months of travel. To travel from Earth to Mars would take eight months. So it's a long, long trip. So to go to Mars and to come back would take you almost a year and a half of travel, okay? So it's quite far away. Now, after Mars, we have the biggest planet in our solar system, which is Jupiter. And there is Jupiter. It's a big planet. It's also called an, uh, a gas giant, okay? So it's made of gas, okay? And Jupiter has a really important function it actually protects those inner planets, which includes Earth, which is where we live, from a lot of other objects that are traveling through space. So asteroids and comets that could possibly hit Earth, they actually get sucked into Jupiter 
And so Jupiter is kind of like our protector in space. It protects those inner planets from some of those larger objects. Okay. Now, after Jupiter, we have another gas giant, which is Saturn. And Saturn has a very important feature that's not shown in this video. Do we know what we're missing on Saturn? Elliot and your brother, I see your hand up. The Go for rings it. of Saturn. They're made of oh. rock, ice, and um, heat. Well done. So the rings of Saturn are actually missing in this video, but we can actually fly into them a little later. Uh, but and the next the... one is my and the next one's my favorite is Uranus. Well done. It is Uranus, the next one. Uranus has a um kind of a ring as well, but yes. some people but some people do it not like uh, just think it's just a ball. <laughs> You're absolutely That's right, my Elliot. Favorite and and that you know what? what is my favorite planet because my favorite color is light blue and Uranus is light blue and the next one's going to be the windiest and thunderstorm yes yes thank you for sharing Elliot you're absolutely correct so Uranus does have rings around it it has a ring that goes around uh the planet as well as our last planet which you mentioned earlier which is Neptune and Neptune is the furthest planet in our solar system so it's the blue one right at the end and uranus and neptune are those ice giants so they're primarily made of ice so they're very cold and the coldest planet would be neptune it's the furthest one from the sun so now we're going to look at some of these a little bit closer starting with our closest planet to the sun which is mercury and it is our smallest planet in our solar system and it's made of primarily rock okay so it's what we call one of our terrestrial planets. So it's made of those uh, of rock. Now our next one here is Venus. And I mentioned earlier that Venus has a very thick atmosphere. So it has a big layer of gas that surrounds the planet. So in a moment, we're going to get rid of that atmosphere to show you what the surface of Venus looks like. And here we go. That is what the surface of Venus looks like. It looks very different than when we have that atmosphere around it. Now, Venus is not some place you would want to go because it has an atmosphere primarily made of carbon dioxide. And the rain on Venus is acid rain. So it's sulfuric acid rain on, the, on Venus. So we would never want to go there. We wouldn't survive. Um, but it's beautiful to look at from afar, okay? So that is Venus. We're going to add its atmosphere back. And that's what keeps it at that very hot temperature because it traps that heat from the sun. And then we have Earth that we looked at. And that's where we live. We live on planet Earth. And then we have Mars here. And looking at Mars, it has that red color, which comes from um, the what it's made of. So it is a bit of a rocky surface. Um, and you can see that that temperature there is about minus 62. So around minus 60 degrees. Then we have our big gas giant, which is Jupiter. And we're gonna look at a very interesting part of Jupiter in a moment. Hopefully gonna... There we go. So all of these rotate on an axis. So they rotate around. And you're going to see this spot. Does everybody see that spot on Jupiter right there? That is called, it's the red spot. But it's, also, it's actually a storm. And it's a storm that's been brewing on Jupiter for over 300 years. So we discovered this storm about 300 years ago. And it might actually be even older than that, but we've only known it for 300 years. So we guesstimate that its age is about 300 years. But it is a very old storm that, that is continuous on the surface of uh, Jupiter that we can actually see. And there, I believe there's a, actually a few Earths that could fit within that storm. It is a massive storm on that surface of Jupiter. And then we have our last few planets, which are Saturn, Uranus, which is Elliot's favorite, and Neptune. Okay. 
So do we have questions about our planets, our eight planets? Elliot, I see the hand go straight up. Let's hear your question. So, um, There is one difference about the two ice giants. Let's hear it. They're both made of ice, which okay. is not a difference. But the difference is uh, that Uranus is kind of a um, light bluish green one. Yes. Yes. Let's yeah, so so share something. Uh, Oh, no. Okay. Eddie and favorite is the same. Eddie and favorite is actually my favorite as well. And uh, is Neptune the stormy one or is it the snowy one? It's the stormy one. Right? Well done, Elliot. It's the stormy one. Has some crazy storms tail. <laughs> yes. My brother's named Sam, so just call him Sam. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing that, Elliot and Sam. That was great. So, now, one thing that was mentioned in the chat earlier, which was Pluto. Now, Pluto used to be a planet, um, but it got demoted a few years ago. So Pluto looks a little bit, it looks like this. This is what Pluto looks like. I see your question, Elliot, and we'll come to it shortly, okay? We'll talk about Pluto first, okay? So this is Pluto. It used to be the ninth planet in our solar system, but a few years ago, about 15 odd years ago in 2006, so longer than 15 years, scientists came together and they started to have a discussion, disagreement about whether Pluto could actually be considered a planet. Okay. And in that discussion, they came up with three things that made a planet a planet. Okay. And the first one was that a planet, to be considered a planet, you have to orbit around the sun. And so if we look right here at this video, you can see that Pluto is orbits along that red line, okay? And um, it orbits along that red line. So it does orbit around our sun, okay? So first check mark, yes, it for now can be considered a planet. But the second rule, was that it had to be round. Now, this is not showing the full planet, but do we agree that Pluto is round? You can shake your heads if you say think yes. Yeah? So Pluto is round. It, so Elliot, I see you shaking no. There's a little bit of the planet that's missing because it's shaded, okay? So it is an actually a round, plant, or a round object. Um, so Pluto met the first two criteria. But the third criteria is that to be a planet, you have to orbit around the sun alone. And unfortunately for Pluto, it had some friends with him. And you're going to see those in a second. So we can see all of our planets and different objects traveling through. And Pluto is that red line. And there you go. Those are, all those lines represent different objects that travel along the similar or same orbit as Pluto, and this is called the Kuiper Belt. And because of that, Pluto could no longer be considered a planet because it wasn't traveling by itself. And so because of that, Pluto was demoted to what we call a dwarf planet. So it's just a little bit of a smaller planet, but it cannot be considered one of our planets in our solar system, okay? And so that's the story behind Pluto. Um, why he can no longer be considered a planet, why he's now called a dwarf planet. Now, I see the question in the chat from Emma. Why is Venus hot when Mercury is closer? So I love that question because it, wouldn't it make sense the closer planet to the sun would be the one that's the hottest, right? But what happens is because Venus, and we'll look at Venus a little bit. So this is what Venus looks like. Okay, and we can see that it kind of looks like gas almost when you look at the planet. And that's because Venus has a very thick atmosphere. So it has this big layer of gas that's around it. Okay, and what happens is when the sun, when the heat from the sun hits Venus, that gas traps it on the surface. And so it keeps it close to the planet. 
And what happens is when all that heat gets trapped, it heats up that planet. So it gets very, very warm. And so even though Mercury is closer, it, and it does get quite hot, Venus can capture and trap the heat that it gains from, that it gets from the sun. And because of that, it's a hotter planet. Does that answer your question, Emma? Yeah? Okay. So that's why it's hotter. Um, but Mercury does get hot during the daytime. So great question. Now I know Elliot had a question as well. So let's hear your question, Elliot. Emma, I was gonna, I was gonna say that that Pluto was gonna be traded to the dwarf planets, but um, I had, I ha I came up with a new one. What okay. are, what are the other four names of the dwarf planets? The other four dwarf planets. Oh, you've caught me on something, Elliot. I don't know all the names of our dwarf planets because there's many different dwarf planets out there. I know so I don't. Okay, so but we actually, but we actually explored. First of all, in, in, in a video, we actually explored five of the dwarf planets. Yeah, that's awesome. Do you want to share what the dwarf planets are, Elliot? Let's hear them. I think one of them is the Pluto that traded the. Yes. Absolutely. But I don't remember the other four. You know what I remember? Okay. The, um, um, I remember one of the shapes. The little walky one? Yeah, there's <laughs> a little like oval thing that yeah. that was that was going like that, and I have no idea who he was meaning, but he <laughs> that's the okay. One, but he was the closest one to the sun. And he was tipped okay. on its side. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so um, I see we have another person unmuted. I'll get to your question. I think it's Eleni. I might be pronouncing yeah. it correctly. Um, but I will come to you in a second just to answer Elliot's question about the dwarf planets. So there's Pluto, there is uh, Eris, and then Ceres, which is another uh, dwarf planet. But there's many others out there that don't that have numbers in their names and things like that. So you're absolutely correct. Okay, I'm gonna come to Eleni's question now, okay? Go ahead. Okay, so the other Earth planets are Havana, uh, Havana, Havana and Makimaki. Yes, yeah, so I believe you're correct. There's a few, I've heard of those. Um, I'd have to check if they are dwarf planets, but yes, um, Havana and Makimaki are some, I think they. some of those might be stars. I'd have to check. You're absolutely correct. Well done. Um, well done. There are some many dwarf planets out there, and it's just because they don't travel alone that they can't be considered planets in our solar system. But thank you for sharing. That was wonderful. Um, did you have a question? Did you want to yeah. ask something about the planets? No. no, you're good? Okay. <laughs> thank you for sharing. Um, so, We've looked at our planets. We've looked at our stars. Now, I'm, my next question for everybody, has anyone ever wanted to travel to space? Does anyone want to go to space? Elliot has his hand up. Sam has his hand up. I love it. Anyone else? Emma wants to go. Maybe. Emily says maybe. Do you know why? Do you know why we want to go? Let's hear it. I'd love to hear why you want to go to space. To well, find a new planet. Yeah, to find and name a new planet because I there are lots of planets in different galaxies that science have not that scientists have not named. Well, there are there are many, and actually, I'm going to show you something really fun um, before we look at what it would be like to be in space. So we're going to come back to this, and I'm going to get rid of our constellations because we don't need our constellations right now. Um, and we're going to, here we go. So all of those green dots are what we call exoplanets. And those are planets that are outside of our solar system. They might be in our galaxy. They could be somewhere else in the universe, but those are all different planets that have been discovered. And there's one that I'm looking for, where is he? So there's a few right there, but a few years ago, 
pardon the rapid movement here. Here we go. So you're going to see these squares pop up where there are a lot of planets. And so these, all of these squares, there are about 4,000 planets they've discovered. And these are 21 squares. And over a period of 10 years, scientists were observing those 21 squares. And they found all of these planets within that area. And so there are many, many planets out there, exoplanets, because they're not part of our solar system, many planets that have not been explored, but that are out in space. Okay, and so you can imagine that if we did observations on the rest of what we can observe and the rest of space, we would find thousands of planets likely that are out there. So there are many planets to explore. So I, that's a great question, Elliot. Um, and that's a great comment. There are many planets that you could explore, but they are very, very, very far away. So it would take a long time to get there and observe them. Now I see that well, Eleni has another thing to tell you. Oh. I have one more thing to tell you. Okay, let's hear it, Elliot. Um, every um, I have been um looking up at the sky. Yes. The reason when 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 it's always a clear sky, and I've seen the Big Dipper, the Little Dipper. I think I've seen the North Star, which is at the top of the Little Dipper. Yeah. And I think, um, I think I've seen some planets as well. I think, uh, I think I've yes. seen, um, um, I saw Earth. I saw Earth. Well, you're on Earth. Jupiter. So yeah. Jupiter. Yeah. We, we, uh, and you can also, it's, it's, it's so weird. You can see Venus. Yeah. Mars. Well done. Jupiter. You well done. Those. You can actually, you can absolutely see those in space um, and see those from Earth. Now, and you can see Venus the easiest because it's the brightest planet. Well done. So what we can do, so right now I'm going to get rid of the ground. And Venus is actually in the Southern Hemisphere right now, but you can actually see planets just from observing the sky. And so that is Venus there. This one here would be Mars. I believe that would be, there's Saturn and this is Mercury. So they're all right now in the Southern hemisphere, but you can sometimes see them in the daytime and they would come up right as either the sun is setting or the sun um, I don't think, is but rising I don't think you could actually see Jupiter. I don't think you could see Jupiter because- Jupiter would be a little bit hard to see. Some of them are harder to see just because- But actually, so but actually I really saw Jupiter and look- That's awesome. And and look, do you see that? Sam yeah. just showed up. A, I have a super Earth at yeah. the solar system. And look, it Perfect. shows. Uh, and look, it shows. There's there's the sun. There's Mercury. That's there's, awesome. There's Venus. There's Earth, okay. Earth. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Elliot and Sam. That's awesome. I'm then gonna after, ask you, and then I'm, after we're gonna show, and then after we have another thing to show you on Super. Okay, Earth. we'll come back to you a little later, okay, Elliot? Um, but I'll ask Eleni, what's your question or comment that you'd like to share? My comment is they say there is a Earth like planet that is known to have water and known to have living life. Do you know what the name of that planet is? No, I don't remember. Okay. There might be. I actually haven't heard yeah, that. Okay. That's what I know. <laughs> but there likely is maybe one, um, maybe not in our solar system. So there's no planet right now in our solar system that would be able to support life. Because I'm going to ask you this. What do we need on Earth? What do we have on Earth that helps us live every day? Um, what do you oxygen. Mean? What else? Oxygen. Water. Water. Well done. And hydrogen. Yeah. What about hydrogen? Hydrogen. hydrogen, yes, hydrogen. Hydrogen. Um Emily, I think, has her hand up. I'll ask Emily to share. What do, what else do we have on Earth that we, we need to survive? 
Um, you need trees because it helps with the oxygen. So what you breathe out goes into the trees and what you breathe in comes out of the trees. Well done. Absolutely. So trees take in carbon dioxide and they produce oxygen. So they help us survive. So we would need oxygen, water, and we need a source of food. So a way to be able to grow food. On garden. Plant. Exactly. A garden. There you go. And so we would need some of those on another planet to be able to actually live there and survive. And so also, right now, yeah, let's hear it. You also need like a source of like meat. Yeah. So you would need a source of food, right? Or anything to support life. And so all those animals that we do consume, they would need that source of food as well. So you're absolutely correct. So we, all of those things we would need on another planet to be able to sustain life. And so on the planets in our solar system, there's not really those ideal conditions for us to survive right away. Uh, and so astronauts and scientists are studying space to find out if there are some of those other, possibly other planets. And they may have discovered one. And I'm, I'd have to check on that. But thank you for sharing that because I will definitely look into it. Um, but all of those planets that you see here could possibly support life. Um, but we would just have to figure out a way to get there and to be able to survive on those planets. But for now, we have figured out ways to survive in space. And astronauts travel to space and they study Earth, they study planets from space. And so we're gonna look a little bit at what it's like to live up in space. And the, does anyone know what the name of the station is called where astronauts live when they go to space? Uh, I see Eleni's hand up. And you can tell me your name because I think that's your mom's name. <laughs> yes. Your name? My name is Michelangelo and the, the name of the station is called the International Space Station. You're absolutely correct. It's the International Space Station. And so we're going to a little bit at what it's like when yep. astronauts live up in the International Space Station. Okay, and we're going to look at what some of those experiences are like. So we can see that this astronaut here is washing her hair. Now, when you are up in space and up in the International Space Station, the effects of gravity are a little bit less. Okay, so it's a little bit lower. And so you, everything kind of floats. And so your hair that is stuck to your head and falls down love, all over your face would actually just stick up straight in space, okay? So it kind of would look like that. And this astronaut is actually washing her hair. Um, and we'll look a little bit later on at what water actually does in space and what it looks like in space. And I do see hands up, so we'll come to that a little bit later, okay? I will come back to your questions. So in space, when astronauts are doing their work, you can see that they kind of float there. Um, we're going to look at very shortly. So they start off with their morning routine. They would do things normally. So they would shave in the morning if they normally shave. Um, and this is what water looks like in space. Water in space is kind of sticky, okay, is the way I would describe it. So normally it would just fall over your face and you can wash your face easily and wash your hair. But in space, it because of the, those differences in um, the gravitational kind of pull and a lesser effect, it kind of just sits there. And it's kind of like a glue almost. And so you can see the astronaut has a little bit of water on his head and it just stays there. And around a towel, it's kind of, it just stays around the towel. But the fun part is that you can actually play with your food in space, which I know your parents are like, absolutely not, not allowed to play with your food. In space, astronauts do that every day. And so here you can see he's forming a ball of water and he can just drink that. So it will float there and you can go and drink that from it just hanging there, which is kind of fun. Uh, but you brush your teeth normally, water acts the same in your body, so you can just brush your teeth um, in the same way that you would on Earth. And this was a shower, this is not in the International Space Station, but what one used to look like. And then this is the space toilet. So 
in space, we've already talked about how the effects of gravity are a little bit less and things float, right? Now, we wouldn't want those things to float, right? I hope everyone knows what I'm talking about, but we wouldn't want any of that to float. And so the toilets in space are like a big suction or a big vacuum. So they suck everything in to make sure nothing escapes, okay? And the astronaut's gonna show you that in a second here. So that is the toilet that she's pointing at there. And when you go to the bathroom here, you would be floating as well. So to keep you on the toilet in space, you have to wear a seatbelt, which I'm sure none of us have ever worn a seatbelt when we went to the bathroom. But if you go to the International Space Station, you'd have to wear a seatbelt to make sure that you don't just float away. Um, and so it's a little bit of a different system in space, um, but that's what it would look like. And in space, another thing that's a little bit different is the way that you eat food. And one thing, um, it'll show you in a moment. So you can see there that the astronaut is eating food out of a tortilla. There he's playing with his food, it's just floating around. But he's eating food in a tortilla. Why would we use a tortilla and not toast or bread? What might be different about it? Because nothing falls out. Nothing falls out. And what comes with a bread if we to toasted bread? What happens? What what's on your plate at the end? Crumbs. Crumbs, exactly. And so if you eat toast or bread in space, those crumbs could just float away and they could get into machinery. They could get into spaces that you wouldn't want crumbs to be, right? And so in space, they use tortillas because they don't produce those crumbs. And so if you go up into space, get used to those tortillas because that's how they make those sandwiches. And in space, the other part is that food has to get rehydrated to heat it up. So they don't actually have microwaves in space because if we had a microwave in space, those microwave uh, waves that could dam be damaging to us are kind of just, they, they could be very damaging in space because the effects of gravity and those protective measures aren't uh, there in the same way. And so to heat up food, they use what they call a rehydration station. So all the food in space is dehydrated into these packs. And what they do is they stick it on the rehydration station and the water comes out warm and it rehydrates the food and heats it up that way rather than using things like a microwave or an oven. And so there you go, water goes into that, heats up the food and now it's ready to eat. Mm, and you they, can play with it. They take beans and like, um, like, like canned stuff and Could they, they eat it. Yeah. They eat it out of the can. Yeah. Then they just put water in it and stuff. Exactly, exactly. Because it's um, it's better to reheat it with that water than to heat it with anything else. And so there you go, astronauts playing with their food um, because of because of um, kind of that lesser gravity. Uh, Eleni, I see that you have a question. Yes, I have a question. Is it real that they say, because Michelangelo doesn't want to ask, uh, is it real that they um, filter the pee and they drink it after? Um, I don't know if that's, I'd have to check that. I don't mean. Because um, I read this somewhere, but I don't know how much is true or just, you know, a space myth. Right. Um, so... Um, from my initial look online, they don't necessarily drink the pee, but they would, um, there are mechanisms to turn it, to extract the water from that, um, to be able to make it drinking water. Um, but I'm not sure if that's a normal process. So I'd have to check my facts that on that a little bit more. I'm not sure if it's something that's normally used or it's something that they're working on experimentally. So I'd have to check that and I can do that afterwards for you. Absolutely. Thank you for the question. Um, so I'm going to let this video keep playing and I see that I know Elliot and Sam had questions. So I'm going to let this play and you can watch this as Elliot asks his question. Go ahead, Elliot. 
Well, you know what? Um, um, a spaceship is actually called like a ship, like the the like the ship you are in. So the, the um, spaceship. So what they are in, what they are in right now. So all these videos. Ship. It's a rocket ship because it's a, ro it's a rocket at the bottom. That's right. Yeah. Going. So it is a rocket ship, and they actually look really cool, which I can show you in a moment. Um, so where all these astronauts are is the International Space Station, but to get them up there, they would use what we would, what you could call a rocket ship. Um, but I'll just note this. So science, so astronauts, when they go up into space, they aren't using their muscles every day, right? Because they're not walking like we do. Okay. And what happens when you don't use your muscles, they get smaller, right? And if they get back to, to earth after being in space and they haven't used their muscles, they, it might be a little bit difficult to walk. And so these astronauts, when they're up in space, they have to use this equipment to keep them on the workout equipment and make sure that they're using their muscles to keep them strengthened for when they get back to earth, okay? And so uh, Elliot's question about, do you wanna remind me of your question? Oh, rocket ships, yes. So I'll show you what a rocket ship looked like when we first started to explore space. This is what they look like. So this is a massive rocket ship. You can see the people compared to the size of the rocket ship. They were huge. Um, and this was in the 1960s, 1970s. Uh, they were around this size. But nowadays with things like SpaceX, they're much smaller. So they- Sam really wants to sh um, show, um, add something though. Sure, let's hear it, Sam. Did you know astronauts sleep on the wall? Yes, they do. They do sleep on the wall. They tie them into those big sleep sacks, um, kind of like what everyone probably they slept in as a baby. Stick to a wall and they have to go to sleep. That's weirder than just sleeping in your own bed. It's really fun. <laughs> I do agree. It's a little weird, but it's because in space, since you float, you could technically just fall asleep floating where I you don't are. Know why so it to keep comfy. Pardon? I don't know why it seems comfy. To sleep on no. a wall or sleep in? Yeah. Sleep on the wall. <laughs> Just sleep on I, the I wall? Think every rocket ship could probably carry like at least 100 people. Well, this rocket. one, this, the one that you're looking at right now, the reason that it's so big is because and back then they had to use a lot, a lot of fuel, even nowadays, but they didn't have the technology to compress everything down. And so these were huge, and the majority of this this rocket ship or spaceship would have been filled with fuel and oxygen to get these uh, astronauts up into space. Now they're a little bit smaller than this, but you're absolutely correct. Um, but now I'm going to check in uh, with our um, leaders at the Blue Mountain Public Library. We are at about a little bit past an hour, so I just wanted to check in with you before I keep going. I can take more questions if you'd like. Okay, great. I have the event going until quarter after. So we have about seven more minutes if everyone wants to get their questions in before then. Sounds good. Okay. Um, I see Elliot's hands up right away. So let's hear your question, Elliot. Um, I really wanted um, you to show us about black holes before we leave because I really wanted to know about black holes. I only watched like one video about black holes that you can only go in one direction for the black holes and it's kind of like just going straight and then it's kind of like a thing that closes every time you step ahead once and you can't go back you're just stuck in it you're absolutely right you once you're in a black hole you cannot escape it okay yeah. you, um, cannot, you cannot get out you just stay near yes so you're absolutely correct i'm going to show you um a black hole. So this is the first image ever taken of a black hole. Now, a, a black hole, what it is, it's what happens after a very, very big star dies, okay? So that's one type of black hole. But what happens is when a star dies, it compresses and all its gravitational force compresses into this black hole. And the reason it looks black is because no light can ever escape a black hole. So the gravitational pull, so the force on earth, we are pulled down to earth by gravity. That's what allows you to sit on your couch, to sit in the chair, 
for you to be not floating around, right? But in a black hole, that force is so strong that even the speed of light, which is the fastest known thing that we know of on Earth and in space, is not able to escape that black hole. And so if you get into a black hole, you, can never, you cannot escape it. And I'll continue that in a moment because I see the question in the chat about the program that I'm using. Um, so the first one looking up at space is Stellarium, which is free to download online. The other ones are um, Universe Sandbox and uh, Space Engine. So if you are interested in downloading any of them, I put those in the chat. The last two, you do have to pay to get those programs, just so you know. But to go on with black holes, what happens with a black hole? Um, so what happens when a star gets sucked into a black hole? This is what it would look like. So you can see that the star starts to get stretched out, okay? And it kind of has this long tail now. And what happens is because as the star gets close to the black hole, the side that is closer to the black hole has a stronger pull. So the black hole has a stronger pull on that side of the star than on the side that's further away. And what happens is it stretches it out. And that process is one of my favorite terms in astronomy. It's called spaghettification, which is amazing. <laughs> um, but it's that process of it thinning out like that. And so eventually, as the, black, as the star enters the black hole, it's going to form this ring around the black hole as it's entering it, because there's so much force um, from that black hole. And that's what we call the accretion disk. So the disk that is around that black hole. And some of that energy does get pushed out because of that force. Um, and that's what you see kind of spewing out the sides of that black hole. And eventually it would get fully sucked into that black hole and you would not see that star again, okay? So I'll let that play again. Um, I see that Eleni has a question and then Emily. So Michelangelo, let's hear your question. Yeah, I have no comment actually. There let's was one it. super massive black hole in the middle of the uh, Milky Way galaxy. You're absolutely correct. And that's a different type of black hole to the one that I'm showing you here. So the supermassive black holes are typically found at the center of galaxies. So there's one at the center of the Milky Way. There'd be one at the center of the Andromeda galaxy. So you're absolutely correct. The one that I'm showing you here is called, I believe, a stellar black hole. So that's formed from the death of a star. So you're absolutely right. Okay. Thank you for sharing. Um, let's hear Emily's question. Um, what is a rocket ship now and a rocket ship that was first invented? Um, what does the rocket ship now look like? Great question. So I'll show you a little bit of a video of um, what the SpaceX rocket ships look like, okay? And this video is going to show you a lot of the failures that they've had. So this is what it looks like. Um, and you can see there that it's much thinner, right? It's a thinner rocket ship than the one that I showed you in the image before. Now I'll tell you this, in all of these, this first part of the video, there is not a person in these rocket ships, okay? Because they are going to explode. <laughs> so there's not a person, there's nothing in them. These are tests, okay? So they can figure out how to get these rocket ships to space, okay? And so, they launch them up into space and sometimes they don't work. And that's what happens a lot of the times when with these space explorations and these new ships, they try different techniques to get them to land. Um, and sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. And so they have to do a lot of tests to see, um, but they are much smaller than those larger ships. So that's kind of what they look like. Does that answer your question, Emily, just to show you the difference there? Yeah, also what is, um, like inside of them really look like? So the inside of a space, ah, good question. So where the astronauts would sit, right? Is that, is that your question, Emily? Yeah, where they would sit. So before I show you that, I will show you that they are successful 
eventually at landing the spaceship. I'm just gonna speed it up a bit, pardon me for that. There we go. So what they're trying to do with this ship is to get it to land on four legs. So you can see the legs right there sticking out. So they're trying to get it to land straight up. And this was the first time they were successful in doing that. So they did get a success in the end. Um, and there you go. So what it looks like inside, um, I'll let that play while I find the image for you. So here we go. So this is kind of what it's like. If you were to travel in a rocket ship up into space, you would be in very, very tight quarters, okay? So this is a very kind of compact area. You can't walk around, you can't do any of those things. So it's very tight within these rocket ships and these spaceships to get into space. Okay? Does it have heat in them? Yes, so they would have heat, those, the, um, the suits that they wear would keep them warm as well. Um, but there, there's all those protective layers to make sure that they don't get too hot or too cold. So absolutely, because as you travel into space, space is very, very cold. So they need ways to make sure that they are kept warm. Great questions, Emily. Thank you for those. Um, Elliot, I see your hand. It'll be, I think, our last question for today. Um, um, I have two questions. The okay, first let's hear one them. is uh, that when you fall into a black hole, the, spirit, the experience of time is kind of different in the black holes. You're absolutely and, correct. And, and if we swap the sun for a massive black hole, nothing pretty much would change, except we would just freeze to death. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Well, do you want to see what uh, the size of a black hole would be if the, or let me reword that, what a black hole would look like if our sun died. So the size of it, I'm going to show you right here. So there's Earth, there's our sun, and we're going to add a black hole here that would be the size, theoretically, if our sun would produce a black hole. So our sun is too small to actually produce a black hole um, when it dies, but we're gonna show it right here. So there it is. It's very small. There we go. Um, but that's a black hole and it actually would be about three kilometers wide. So our sun that is huge compared to our earth, if our sun died and produced a black hole, the black hole would be only about three kilometers wide. And that's how compressed it gets when a star dies and makes a black hole, they get so condensed and they get much smaller than the actual size of the star. So what was your second question there, Elliot? It was, that um, the seven continents that are on Earth mm -hmm. are North America, South America, Asia, Australia, Euro Europe, Antarctica, and Africa. Yes, you're and absolutely. And um, for reason, the um, Earth mm -hmm. Antarctica is the coldest, and um. For a black hole, um, yep. how actually long would it take for a um, black hole to get to go through the sun? How long will it take for a black hole to get through the sun? Okay, so that's I'm um, okay. So I'm gonna rephrase that. So when it comes to black holes, they form when a star dies. So if our sun died and was big enough to make a black hole, it would be the size that I showed you in that video. Okay, but for our sun, so let's say for a star to get sucked into a black hole, how long would it take? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly how long it would take. And it would actually- Probably and, like a day or something, probably like a day. I, I'd have to check the numbers on that. So I, don't have, I won't give you a specific number because I'm not too sure, but because time is different in a black hole, um, the one side of the star would be traveling at a different speed or different time span to the other side of the star because of the effects in a black hole. So because time gets shifted, it would actually, yeah, go ahead. Do you think 
do you think we should um end the meeting because we got a bit more than an hour i know i know and i will end it by showing you the parts of a black hole so that's what they look like and everything gets sucked into that center which is called the singularity so thank you elliot i know we're way past our time uh, <laughs> but thank you all for having me today i will come back to you thank you all for having me this was a lot of fun and i hope you enjoyed it on your first day of march break um so thank you all for having me Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much, Julia. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. We'll see you later. Enjoy your March break.